Who are we talking about today? What are we talking about today? Anybody know? Okay, good. Because that's what I came here to talk about today. Um, We got turn around. Oh, no, I want to turn around and then I want to turn the camera around. All right. Let's see. Is that pointed mostly at the screen? Yeah. Perfect. Can you see the screen? Beautiful. All right. And we've already established that you guys can hear me without amplification, right? Next time we should untangle this before we start the lecture. Wait, wait, wait. Almost. 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 Oh, 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 oh. Got it. Several years ago, I was uh, I was doing some consulting for a uh, for a local uh, machine shop, job shop kind of machine shop. They had um, 50 spindles in their shop, maybe 20,000 square feet or so size facility. So 50 machine tools with a spindle, and maybe I'm trying to think how many employees they had. I never really asked. But judging from the people walking around the shop, they probably had about 15 people running the machines. Uh, they had some, uh, a couple of engineers, one boss guy that kind of did sales. So maybe 20 people total in the whole company, 50 spindles. And um, in my job there was actually, we talked at the beginning of the class, we talked about lean manufacturing. Is that true? Okay, we, we introduced the idea of lean manufacturing at the beginning of the class. So my job there was as a lean manufacturing consultant. So my job there, actually, they, they wanted to do a couple things. So uh, who's done the tool building lab? So about half of you have done the tool building lab. And so this is, this is where we put the, the tools together in like the collet holders so that we can then bring them over to the machine and put them in the machine. And so they had a guy at the shop that did, he was the tool room guy. And a lot of shops about this size or bigger will have a tool room guy. And the tool room guy's job is to, they'll get a, uh, they get like a, a work order or something like that. So this is the job that's going to be running on XYZ machine today. And so he gets his work order and it's got a list of tools on it. And you can imagine the list looks like half inch end mill or three eighths inch end mill or seven sixty fourths of drill, things like that, right? And tool numbers, because you know in a spree, when you have a tool, you associate it with a tool number, and then you put it in the correct location in the machine tool, so the machine knows which tool to use. And so his job was all day long to build tools and tool holders. Then they had a special machine for measuring the length of the tools. In how do we measure the length of the tools downstairs? Yep. What do we call the sensor, anybody? So how do we measure the tools downstairs? Using the sensor thing, what do we call the sensor? Somebody, who, who said it? This one's gonna be challenging. Oh, Jesus. Robert gets a free one. Oh. <laughs> All right. So we use the probe, right, to set the tools. So they had a special machine for setting the tools. <laughs> Sorry about that. Everybody brought safety glasses today, right? So, uh, so they had a special machine, and so he would um, he'd measure the tools, print out a little label, put it on the tool holder, put it in a tool cart, and that cart was then set to go to a particular machine. And so I, I spent the day with him, and I made some recommendations to the company about how to better make his process work. 
The next day was my job to follow around the guy that set up all the machine tools. So they had a guy that built the tools, they had a guy that set up all the machine tools. And so I followed him around, and one of the things that we did, so his job that day actually was to set up one machine to do one part. They were gonna make 80 pieces. <clears throat> I think if I remember correctly, the workpiece material for that job cost them $150 per part. So they didn't wanna screw any of those 80 pieces up. I don't know what they were charging the customer for the parts, but something in that range. So my job was to follow him around. And as he, we followed him around, he told me some stories. So there was, there was, a, um, there was a fairly large machine. I'm trying to think what the brand was. It doesn't matter what the brand was. But um, we walked by it, and there was a ginormous bulge inside of the machine, protruding out. Ginormous bulge inside of the machine. And he says, yeah, you should have been here that day. And so they had in the machine something called a tombstone fixture. And so, and we'll talk about that later in the class here, but they had this tombstone, and, and it looks sort of like a tombstone. And it's on a rotary axis, so you could bolt parts onto the side of it, and then it can rotate. And so in this machine, it was a, a, the spindle, it was a milling machine, but the spindle went left and right, not up and down. Now, the spindle still lined up with the z-axis. It goes left and right, though, so they call this a horizontal milling machine. And so you can imagine now if you have a tombstone, if you rotate that tombstone around, you'd have parts that are ready to be machined for the next process, right? And so it's a, it's a method for speeding up the manufacturing. So the tombstone was not correctly fixed to the table. And so fix is the root word for fixture, correct? So when the cutting forces were applied to the tombstone, and it was not correctly affixed to the table, it fell over. Ooh. And it, it put this giant bulge in the side of the machine tool. That was, in, that was expensive, right? So, um, so this particular one, Chris is responsible for this. You guys see what the picture is? So this is a lathe. It's, a, it's actually a Haas lathe. You can see the little H in the corner there. Uh, it's a Haas lathe. Um, they had the chuck is down here. So you can't really see the chuck. It's covered up by M1800. But uh, the, their workpiece was in the chuck. It was a fairly large piece of steel. And then I don't remember which, I don't know which tool it was. Was it the last class where we talked about how much energy was in that piece of metal? that we were spinning in our lathe, because somebody asked the question about holding. Oh, we talked about um, deformation, right? So we deform the parts and we hold them. And so it became unclamped. Now, the clamping pressure was still there, but the lathe was no longer holding onto the workpiece. After it was at speed, once the cutting forces interacted with it, uh, and so that part actually came forward. You don't see, If we zoomed out, you'd see the, the damage to the door also. The door's open now. So that part came forward towards the operator, hit the door, and then still had enough energy to can opener out the back of the lathe after it had ricocheted off the door. Now, luckily for the operator, the door was stronger than the back, right? That is not on accident. That is totally on purpose. The, uh, so it's, it's like, it's, and we're going to talk about this in the last lecture of the class where we talk about design of safety systems. So that door is part of the safety system that keeps the operator from dead. And, um, and so I once sat next to a guy on the airplane that worked at uh, one of the jet engine manufacturers. I can't remember which one it was. He's an engineer. And I guess he was an extroverted engineer because we actually had a conversation. Um, and he, uh, he was responsible for designing the shrouding that goes in the, so the jet engine works by having the air go through and the turbines spin really fast and all that stuff, right? And um, his job was the safety part of the shrouding, not the make it look cool part of the shrouding. The, the part that kept the turbine blades from coming into the passenger compartment if the engine happens to explode. And they do explode sometimes. Not in the sense of big fiery explosion, but they come apart. Uh, he suggested don't sit next to the engines. He was responsible for designing the guarding to keep them from coming into the thing. So anyway, um, but that's, uh, that's guarding. That's not fixturing. 
What is a fixture? You guys have used fixtures. What's a fixture? What do you got? A tool that holds the part that you're working on. Okay. What's the purpose of fixturing? Okay, Robert. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. To keep the part from moving while you're applying a very high rotation. To keep the part from moving. And so this is the fix part of fixturing, right? We fix the part in place. Let's see if I can get this thing to work on the first try. Ooh, that's amazing. I could get it to work on the first try. So the fix part of fixturing keeps the part from moving. What's the during part do? Makes it sound more like a word. Um, but is, is, is keeping the part from moving the only thing that fixturing does? Um, I don't know if it's just, uh, <sighs> We will often try to design our fixturing such that it will reduce or dampen vibrations or chatter. So yeah, but that wasn't what I was asking for. What else does the fixture do for us? Yeah. So you're, you're not eating this candy. Oh, you did. I thought maybe you're going to give it away and you're going to have lots of friends. So what, what were you saying though? Holds the part in a specific orientation. So it will orient so fixturing keeps the part from moving. It orients the part. What else does fixturing do for us? Why, why else might we want to be concerned with how we've designed our fixture? Yes? Okay, so we have to orient it such that, so if we're using a milling machine, the milling machine can only act on surfaces, you get a hard hat? Only work on surfaces that it can see. Somebody back here said something. I saw a hand, yeah? Some years I'm good at throwing the candy, some years I'm not. It locates the part. And if we design it well, uh, and this may be the same thing. This to orient and locate, some people would consider that one thing. Some people would consider it two different things because you guys thought of it independently. Therefore, I know some people would consider it two different things. All right, so fixturing keeps the part from moving. It Does it only keep the part from moving? Sometimes it might move the part, right? Our tombstone is a fixture. Part of its job is to move the part once the machine is ready for a different orientation on the part. So, uh, so, but it keeps it from moving relative to something, right? So, keeps it from moving, <coughs> and um, locates it, orients it. What do we fixture in manufacturing? Now, take a step back. We talk a lot in this class about CNC machining. For just a moment, let's let our minds believe that CNC, I know it's hard to understand, but CNC machining may not be the only type 
of manufacturing process that we will ever encounter in our life. Is it possible that you believe that? Say yes if you believe. Say yes if you believe. Wow, talk about power. <laughs> Uh, when else do we? When else are we going to fix yourself besides CNC machining? And and what what else are we going to do that we requires fixturing in manufacturing? Okay. Are these any good? Hmm. Hmm. I think there's different flavors. I noticed they're like English coffees, so it's possible I had to do the whole lecture in a British accent. I don't know if I could do a British accent for an hour. Um, when do we use fixturing manufacturing? Where do we use it? Describe a fixture to me that's not CNC machining. Somebody. The bed of a 3D printer is fixturing. Yeah. Any time at all when you want something not to move. Yeah. Okay. More specific though. Besides any time at all. Yeah. That one's new. Nobody's ever said that before. I don't know. He doesn't want you to have two. It's dangerous. <laughs> So, so absolutely. So you fixture the jaws of the wrench or the, what do they call those jaws? I don't know. You know what I mean though, the, the, the thingy things on a wrench. You fixture those against the workpiece. Yeah, the nuts of the workpiece. Hey, that tripod for my phone is a fixture. Are we manufacturing here? I'd like to believe that I am. I like to believe that I'm making engineers that know something about manufacturing so that when they practice as engineers, they can design things that can be manufactured. So in this manufacturing scenario, you guys are the work pieces. The lectures and the labs and the homeworks and the assignments, those are the operations. Those are the processes. And uh, it, it's a, we'll revisit lean manufacturing at the end of the class. And we'll talk about how we use the lean manufacturing to design the class. But um, all right, any other things specific fixturing things? What else do we do? Yes. Oh yeah, when we're assembling our tools for down there for CNC machining, that's awfully close to CNC machining. And I did say stuff that's not CNC machining. See. There's danger here. And he's also wearing a maroon shirt, so he's like a target. <laughs> One year, there was a kid on the baseball team, and I had him pinch throw for me. What else do we fix here? Yeah. Stamp a piece of wood when you're screwing it together. We use fixturing when we're doing assembly work. So we hold one part so we can push the other part up against it. We use fixturing when we're doing painting. Anybody ever been to a paint shop where they're painting stuff? They hang the stuff on a little, on a, like a cable. There's a little hook that holds the thing. They paint it. We use fixturing. We do all kinds of plating processes. We use fixturing for almost every manufacturing process. For some part of almost every manufacturing process, the part has to be where we want it to be. Excuse me, the part has to be where we want it to be. So fixturing is important all across there. Now what happens, excuse me, what happens when we fixture something? So if we're fixing it, so we'll talk about locating stuff later, eraser. There it is, right next to where I wanted to erase. Let's talk about fixing stuff, right? We would like to fix it in place. Yeah, and now let's go back to CNC machining. When we fix our part in place, what does it have to do? To fix it, to keep it from moving, what does it have to be able to do? Yeah. I don't know if it has to apply a force to a part. I think it does. It does, because we don't want the part to accelerate, correct? The part in our lathe there was accelerating. 
until it started accelerating the other direction when it slowed down and when it hit the back of the lathe. Right? That's all acceleration, though. Yeah, you guys had something? Right, that's, that's when, so our fixture applies a force in order to oppose the cutting force. Everything? We don't necessarily need equal forces from all sides as long as we don't have an unopposed force. But, but I like where you're thinking, right? So let's talk about fixturing in a vise. And we've talked about that before, right? We've drawn the picture before. Fixturing in a vise, you've all done this in the lab now? Fixtured something in a vise? Let's talk about the components that go into fixturing in a vise. See how good I am at my artwork? Let me. All right. Arm all lubricated up. Ready to go. I got a vise jaw. I got a vise jaw. So is this the top view or the side view? Side view. Okay, perfect. I didn't know yet. But you guys chose. So side view. So I've got the bed of the vise. <coughs> and there's some body down here, right? Of my vise. This one is attached to a thing here. And that's bolted down to this thing. So this is fixed. And in the vices that we have downstairs, this is the back of the machine usually. This would be the front of the machine. This is the happy operator. All right, standing in front of the machine. So this one is also attached to a thing here. That actually is not fixed, right? That slides back and forth. So this slides back and forth, and there's a mechanism, and they're attached down here to the mechanism. There's a screw and a nut, and all that stuff moves through. You crank the handle, vice jaw moves. We have these little parts in here. Anybody you know what those are called? Yes. They're called parallels. Anybody know why they're called parallels? Yeah. Perhaps. You had an answer too? Was it different? Cool. He said too much candy. You need some. Um, they're intended to be parallel. Usually the way you make them to be parallel is you, you get them rough shape, you clamp them together in a grinding machine, and then you grind them at the same time so that it, nominally they're parallel with each other. That's usually how they do that. What's the purpose of the parallels? Yeah. Say again? The workpiece sits on that. Yeah, okay, so let's draw the workpiece. What's the purpose of the parallels? In the back. So it raises it up. That's what you meant to say, right? Was that what you were going to say, Charlie? It was fair because it was hard to tell who I was pointing at. Um, raises the workpiece up so that if the tool needed to work down on the sides here, it doesn't run into what? The fixture, the vice jaw. Um, what happens if your tool touches the fixture? Not necessarily. Yeah, I'm not very good at throwing this today. What happens if the you you absolutely crashed the machine tool? Except in one instance. What's the one instance? It's okay for your tool to touch the vice jaw. Yeah. All right, two instances. When you're doing it on purpose. Cutting the vice jaw on purpose, then it's not a crash. Don't do it on purpose unless you've checked with one of the staff first. But sometimes we actually cut the vice jaw on purpose to relieve material so that when we're cutting our workpiece, we don't crash. So sometimes we have to do that. And sometimes we'll cut the vice jaw into a specific shape to hold a weirdly shaped workpiece. And, and typically then we'll use a soft jaw. We usually make vice jaws out of aluminum instead of steel when we're intending to cut them. But not necessarily. You could machine a steel jaw 
just as well as you can machine a, uh, an aluminum one. The steel one's going to last longer. But yeah, don't, oh, so if you're cutting aluminum, let me draw my machine tool controller. Machine tool controller. Right, so I got the wheel here, right, the jog wheels over there, a couple of buttons up here, a couple of buttons down here. I got my screen, I got my keypad, my power meter maybe, right? And wait a minute. So if you're cutting an aluminum workpiece and you see sparks inside the machine tool, what do you do? Everybody shout it out. He stop. If you're cutting an aluminum workpiece and you see sparks inside the machine tool, everybody shout it out. No. E-stop. If you're cutting any kind of workpiece and it doesn't sound right, what do you do? Okay. Um, I told you about my repetitive stress injury in my shoulder from hitting the e-stop. Maybe I didn't tell you guys, but it's true. Um, e-stop. All right, no sparks. Oh, if you're in the lathe, and it sounds like a helicopter, e-stop, unless you intended to be cutting an interrupted surface. Because if you're in the lathe with that three-jaw chuck, and it sounds like a helicopter, it's because you're cutting the jaws, <laughs> unless you intended for it to sound like a helicopter. OK. Um, picturing. All right, so we've located the part with our parallels. Purpose of the parallels is to locate the part, right, in Z. Purpose of the back vice jaw is to locate the part. What's that direction in the machine? That's Y usually, the way we install the vices. Locate the part in Y. What locates the part in X? So the parallels have located it in Z. The back vice jaw has located it in Y. What locates it next? Yeah. Well, we tell the machine where it is with the probe, but that's not the same as locating it. Locating it means it's always going to be in the right place. Yeah, Charlie. You could use a soft jaw with a feature in it that you push up against the, the X direction. She's scared. Right, so you could do that. Um, but in general, unless you put some feature in there to locate it in X, it's not located in X. Now we have, yeah. Oh, I saw an amazing video on LinkedIn, which is weird because LinkedIn is not like a, a video platform where you see amazing videos. But I have some friends that own a, uh, they own a machine shop uh, in town. I, I want to say in town, but I think it's actually in Millbury. Um, and they make, they actually make fixturing components. They may manufacture fixturing components for metrology. We didn't talk about that, right? But they manufacture parts that go into like a coordinate measuring machine to locate the parts that you're measuring so that you can repeatedly measure the same part over and over again. And um, they wanted to avoid having to set the X offset for their part. And so they knew they don't have to reset the Y offset because it can't move in Y once you've fixed that back vice jaw. They knew if they put it on parallels, they don't have to reset the Z offset as long as all the work pieces are roughly the same height. right? If you get random material coming in, then you're going to have to check it every time. And so what they did is they took a tool holder, they put a dowel pin in it, so it's like a piece of steel rod, held it in a tool holder. They put the part in, Moved the vice jaw over so it was touching but not tight. Ran a program that had the tool come in next to the part, push it over, come up. They actually were doing two parts at once. They would push two parts over, and then they would tighten the vice. So yeah, you could you could jog. Uh, they automated that with a program, but that was that was pretty amazing. Um, look up Phillips Precision Machining on is it is that the name of the company? I think so. Look up Phillips Precision on LinkedIn. You can see the video. Maybe I'll see if I can get another copy of the video and post it on the class website. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, so you can do that. Or um, we make, we make, we use some of our vice jaws. And you always put this on the, attach it to the back of the vice jaw, the back vice jaw. Never attach it to the front vice jaw. Front vice jaw moves. Don't use the front vice jaw to locate your parts. Um, 
if you do a top-down view, some of our rice jaws, you'll notice, have a little slot in them. Anybody seen that? We might not have any of the machines you're using. Uh, there's a little bit that has a, um, a clamp that locks into that slot and has a thing that comes over like that, so you can have an X stop. So you can use a part stop to locate your workpiece. Um, yeah, we'll skip that one. If we have enough time at the end, I'll show those videos. All right, so we've located the part. We know that we have to apply a force to keep the part from moving because of the cutting. What keeps the part? So you've seen these end mills, right? So the end mill looks like this, come down and it's got this spiral, right? And so the rake face is actually inside that spiral. So the chip flows along inside that spiral. When this is rotating, as long as I drew it the right orientation, that spiral tends to put an upward cutting force on the workpiece. If you're drilling, you're actually going to have a downward cutting force because the force from the feed is going to exceed the upward force from the flutes. But in a milling application, when we're moving sideways through the material, we have an upward force on our part. Now, they're at an angle, right? So it's not all upward. So we could calculate the cutting force. How, how could we estimate that cutting force? Remember, we could estimate the cutting force. What do we need to know to estimate the cutting force? Yep. We need to know feed speed, depth of cut, sort of. We don't necessarily need to know speed. It depends on the units we're using. But what else do we need to know if we want to estimate the cutting force? We need to know the KP value for the workpiece, right? We need that formula from the machinery's handbook. We need all those other factors. But if we estimate that cutting force, then uh, we know some of it is up, and some of it is to the side, or towards the front, or towards the other side, or towards the back, depending on what part of the revolution that we're in, right? So at some point, that cutting force will be completely aligned along the x-axis, in the direction that we don't have any part stop. What keeps the part from flying out of the machine? Friction. friction, and only friction. People argue with me when I do the part about what keeps the part from flying up out of the machine. Because they're like, well, what about gravity? And so, okay, if you have a workpiece that weighs 1,000 pounds, then gravity is your friend here. And you probably don't need to even clamp it in. But for most of the workpieces that we use, gravity is insignificant for the holding it down part. So when you get the quiz question, and you will in one of your homeworks or on your final exam that says, what keeps the part from flying up? The only correct answer is friction. If you say friction and gravity, you get it marked wrong because gravity wasn't doing it. We're going to forget about gravity, except I usually relent and give people the points anyway. I'm a sucker like that. All right. What determines the friction? Yeah. And faked you out with that one, didn't I? I think I almost hit your knee. That's pretty good. So, coefficient, how do you know the coefficient of friction? Has anybody ever done the experiment for coefficient of friction? Has anybody taken the um, the class uh, design of machine elements? Is that the one where you do the cams, cam designs or the, uh, the linkage designs and stuff? When you do take design machine elements here, um, when I took it at least, Bob Norton taught it, which is pretty cool because he also wrote the book. Um, and Bob, Bob was really cool. He retired a couple years ago. But in that class, he made us do class projects. And it was maybe one of the hardest classes that I ever took here at WPI because of how in-depth the class projects that he made us do were. Um, but he required us. And the, like, the detail he wanted in the reports and all that stuff. I, that was the only class I ever took at WPI where I ever stayed up all night working on the class. Only class. And, and we stayed up all night several times for that class. And it was my favorite class I took at WPI. I worked hard. I, I wasn't a very good student. I think I maybe got a B or a C. I didn't, I didn't like master the class, but I loved that class. 
So um, we had to do a friction experiment for one of them because we were designing using a linkage design. We were designing a random orbit sander, and we had to know what's the friction coefficient between sandpaper and wood. You guys know how to do the friction experiment? Put your thing on the thing, you tip the table until it starts to slide, and then at that angle you can figure out what the force from gravity was, right? We all did that. So we did that experiment, and we did it for a bunch of different woods and sandpapers and all that stuff so we could get our data to design our thing. But Bob always had a requirement in his assignments that you must have fun while doing this. And so uh, in the beginning in his report things, you had to like list all the requirements and then say in the report where the answer to that was found. It's like, instead of like a regular table of contents, you'd say, all right, so you must have fun was one of the requirements. So we said, see Appendix B. Because after we were done with our friction experiments, we went to the point and had a couple pitchers of beer and had the waitress take pictures and put them in the report for us. Um, Bob loved it. All right, but if you want to avoid the experiment, because I, I asked this question yesterday, who could legally go to the bar and drink beer? And there was like one hand that came up, right? So if you guys don't want to get in trouble by doing the friction experiment, what else could you do? Yeah, you could look it up, right? Uh, we get some examples here. Um, Google is your friend here. There's all kinds of ways to find friction coefficients. But we, uh, we use in uh, fixed tree and CNC machines, very frequently we use aluminum and we use steel. Um, so these are up here for your convenience. What's the units for friction coefficient? You haven't answered a question yet. There aren't any. Um, actually, my seven-year-old's getting pretty good at throwing now. I should have brought her in today to throw stuff because there's no school today. I think four inches of snow and they cancel school. Who, who else grew up in a town where for four inches of snow they would cancel school? Well, where? Falls Church, Virginia. Fa yeah, okay. Where? Maryland. Maryland. Where else? Well, Worcester, yeah, <laughs> grew up in Worcester. <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I was in sixth grade and seventh grade, no, fifth grade and sixth grade, I lived in Georgia, and they would predict that maybe it was going to be cold tomorrow, and it might rain or something last night. And they were afraid of ice, so they would cancel school for that. <laughs> like two days out. Oklahoma. But it snows in Oklahoma. Yeah, but they cancel it real quick. Huh. I am so glad that I am not the person that has to decide. Because all you got to do is choose to keep it open and have one person get hurt. Right? So that's why they're so chicken about it. But, uh, yeah, I went to high school in northern Vermont. They sometimes canceled a couple of the bus routes. And when they canceled the bus route, they were like, get to school on your own. The Where was that? New Jersey. So Jersey's like Vermont. They just don't care. <laughs> well, my favorite part about when they canceled school was, though, I had to drive past the school to get to the ski area. And if they canceled school because of snow, you know I was going skiing. <laughs> All right, what else have I got to talk about today? Um, so, so stress and strain, right? We talked yesterday about how when we squeeze the part, it deforms. When we let go of the part, it undeforms. So years ago, I knew the guy who worked for Boeing Aircraft. And did you know that some of those, like, wing spars for, like, the, especially the fighter jets, they machine those out of one forging? So you might have a 20-foot-long piece, and they machine it, or 60-foot-long piece that's, like, one machined part. And so you can imagine when they're putting that in the fixturing, the fixturing is pretty elaborate for that. And if, if the part comes in and it doesn't quite fit the fixture, it's a lot easier to have Bubba stand on it while you tighten down that spot in the fixture than it is to rebuild the fixture for the slightly oddly shaped part. Now what happens when Bubba gets off the part and you release the fixturing? It goes back to the shape it wanted to be, right? Every time. So um, my, my friend's job was to selectively heat treat parts of these light, giant things. So we'd wrap them with like heater stuff and stuff like that, raise it up to 1,000 degrees, 
and then cool it at a particular rate, it would relax the stresses and it would straighten back out. So his job was to do that. That was not cheap. That was expensive. So, uh, so try to account for these fixturing things. We talked about the stresses there. Uh, what else happens, so especially in the lathe, when we're fixturing our part? Um, the eraser again, I lost it. Oh, because we were friction experimenting. So, so friction is our friend. Friction keeps the workpiece in the machine tool. What happens in the lathe, so we've got our, our Let's say we've got a collet nose again because it's easier to draw. We've got our workpiece coming out of that. Right? And so if we're going to do, so OD turning, where's the tool going to go? Outside diameter turning. What a horrible picture on that thing. So we're doing OD turning. Where's the tool go? Yeah. Right, so we could draw the tool on the top or the bottom, doesn't matter for this picture, right? So let's draw the tool here on the top, and the feed is that direction. So if I've drawn the tool here and the feed is that direction, then the rotation is this way, right? Okay, so we're doing OD turning. And so if we bring the tool down now, and we turn here, right? What's the shape of the part going to be when we're done? So let's say this is one inch. And let's say our depth of cut is 0.1 inches. What's the finished diameter of the part going to be? Uh, 0.08. So we took. Uh, 0.1 times 2 because the depth of cut is on both sides because the part's rotating. Okay. But is it actually going to be 0.08? I'd argue that it'd be 0.8. But... Or yeah, 0.8. Yeah, sorry, not, not 0.8. That's what you meant, right? Maybe I'm the one that said that wrong. I don't know. I said 0.0. Okay. Yeah, I probably said I repeated it wrong. Um, is it actually going to be that diameter? Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah, I hope so too. Plus or minus, Plus or minus something. But the, the reality is what happens here, what direction is the cutting force? When, we, when the tool interacts with the workpiece, what direction is the cutting force? We could assume, so some of it's going to be that way, right? Some of it's going to be that way. If we, and, and the part of it that's that way is going to try to push the workpiece back into the chuck unless we have sufficient friction here to keep it from pushing into the chuck, right? And some of it's going to be tangential to the workpiece, right? And that's going to try to rotate the workpiece in the chuck, right? So we have to have enough friction force here to keep it from rotating and from sliding in. So if we want to make a worst case estimate, though, we could say all of it is that direction. If we just want to make our worst case estimate, we can say all the cutting force is going to be down. What's going to happen to the workpiece when we apply all the cutting force down at this location? What's going to happen to the workpiece? I don't know if he was guarding the basket or if he was doing the alley oop there. What's going to happen to the workpiece? It's going to get pushed away. Because when I push on something, it tries, it tries to move, well, it tries to push back on me, but it moves away. I deflect the part. How much is it going to get pushed down? Yeah. Possibly, but how do we know? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, we did this one. We talked about this yesterday. I'm not going to do it again. We need, to, we need to calculate the cantilever beam deflection. This is a simple round beam. Cantilevered out with a force applied to it. Right? So what's important to note here in our beam deflection equation 
is that so p is the force here right l is the length and the length is the distance from here to where we're applying the force length is cubed first thing i notice in this equation is where are the exponents length is cubed that means length is important. So first thing we want to know is length is cubed. 3EI, what's E? Elastic modulus, right? And we can look that up in a chart. What's I? I have something we call the area moment of inertia. Each cross-sectional shape has an I value. For a circle, I, or for a, a round, Cross section, I is pi r to the woo fourth over four. So, what do we know right off about this equation? Yeah. Radius is important and length is important. And you know, you gotta have all the other forms, right? So, if forces are really high, then you're going to have more deflection, even if length is short. But the further away from the support, the more the deflection. So this part is actually, when it's finished machined, going to look like this. Something like that. Now I've, exa I've exaggerated, right? So the things that make deflection smaller are big radius, and sh short cantilever length. When we're doing machining operations, what deflects? Yeah. Uh, I guess in, in mills, the tool can deflect. When you're doing milling, the tool deflects every single time. When you're doing turning, the workpiece deflects every single time. Um, and so you could you can account for this. Now, how do we how do we limit this this amount of deflection? How could we limit? Because we don't want it to deflect, right? We want it to be the right size. What could we do? Yep. You could hold it at both ends. So with a tailstock, you drill a little hole here, get a little pointy thing here, and that gets pushed in that direction with some force so they stay together. And if you're smart, this pointy thing has bearings in it, so it rotates. And so now we support both ends. And then the shape of our part will be more like this, right? But it'll still deflect in the middle, and, and there's a different equation because it's not simply supported anymore. But uh, you could do that. What else could I do? Yeah. You could decrease the length, and they do that in a machine called a Swiss lathe by instead of having the workpiece supported at one spot, they put it in a bushing, and they move the workpiece in and out as they're doing the cutting, and the tool doesn't move in and out as much. So you can do that. Uh, what else could I do? So one more thing is actually really um, obvious once you've seen it once, is you get something called a steady rest. And the steady rest is basically a ball bearing thing that is opposite where the tool is, and that follows along right here, and it supplies a force in the opposite direction. So you basically hold the part everywhere where you're cutting it. And so this has got bearings and it moves along. Yeah. You could have a CNC steady rest, or you could just have one that supports in the middle, and one that supports in the middle is more common, so it doesn't slide along. You you could you'd have you could do that with a thing that pushes it out right with a constant force, or usually, yeah. There's there's you can Google it and see videos of steady rests and stuff like that. Um, absolutely. Before you come to class tomorrow, we have class tomorrow, right? Before you guys come, unless I get another Thursday emergency. Before you come to class tomorrow, watch a Swiss lathe on the internet. Google Swiss lathe. It is so friggin' cool. You gotta see that. Um, okay, perfect. Uh, and there's, um, oh, there's slides that go with this lecture. You, you might wanna look at the slides. There might be quiz questions that refer to the stuff on the slides that I didn't talk about. But there is no quiz question in this class ever that you can't answer with Google. If you research, you can always find the answer to every question I ask.
two pieces left. Yes, sir. Sure. I'm all tangled here. <laughs> it actually was turned off the live video, too. That's the part that's tangled. That's why, because I was clipped onto that. <laughs> 